Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. And with us today is quite possibly uh, an unsung legend of this field. Somebody who has contributed more in a sort of, I, I, w I don't want to say ghostwriter way because his work is available and it's out there, but it's certainly influenced far more uh, people than you may have realized. So, Without further ado, uh, the inventor, the the founder of the term synchro mysticism. In so many ways, it's hard to you know claim ownership of something so ephemeral. But I think Jake, you did it. So Jake Coatsy, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here, sir. Uh, for folks who might not know about you, with this sort of vague introduction I just gave you, give us a little bit of a, a, a clarifying factor there. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, so I guess it primarily the work I do comes from a lifelong interest in synchronicity. Um, and then starting to share that online, sort of at the beginning, early stages of YouTube, I started using that as a, a way of sharing. I, I first blogged and then I figured, uh, maybe I'd get, uh, more attention with the material by using YouTube. It was just sort of a very new thing at that point. And uh, so I started making videos on YouTube as well and kept blogging for a long time. And then, yeah, just over time, it evolved to the other social media platforms, Instagram and Twitter and all that. And, you know, over the years, I've switched from mediums and, you know, things that I prefer doing. Um, but yeah, I've always just been primarily interested in synchronicity and what it means and how one can interact with it and that kind of thing I think would and then I kind of came up with the term synchromysticism just to frame it a bit in a way that is sort of okay well this is my unique take on it I I assume um because of my beliefs that there's no such thing as coincidence and that there's some mystical angle to uh, the synchronicities I'm seeing. So I just thought the mysticism is appropriate to put it there in the word. And then it just kind of makes it its own thing instead of just synchronicity. But it, it's to me just the same thing as synchronicity. I just call it synchromysticism because it was my flavor of, uh, of, of viewing it. And then I guess a lot of like pop culture influence, I think is a marker as well of like uh, my synchronicity views, just to use it as a sort of a, um, a bridge. It's like there's this whole pool of media that we're all familiar with. Generally speaking, most human beings in this society will be influenced by pop culture. So using that as like, well, you can see synchronicities in this because I was very interested, I think, early on in um, just sharing my private synchronicities day by day. But I find um Every time I've done that, it's it's rest, less relevant than something that's in a movie that everybody knows about. And then they can go, oh, I know that synchronicity I've kind of thing. Right. And so, yeah. But I do a mix of all of that. Like, I like to use the movies and my personal life as well as inspiration for things that I share. Well, and it's very inspiring as somebody who, um, personally, I found the term synchromysticism before learning about yourself, and it's very much a part of how this podcast started, the, the synchronicities that are in pop culture, I think, you know, and I'm very excited to have you on, because we could spend the whole two hours just talking about synchromysticism, but... I do agree with you that there's a relevancy because I've shared private synchronicities here on the show yeah. and there's almost an uncomfortability about it because 
I feel like A, maybe I'm a little too full of myself, and then maybe B, I feel like, why, well, why does anyone care? And the third one, which is kind of the silver lining, which has kept me talking about them in some way, is that for me, looking back to when maybe 10 years ago when I was into all this stuff but really had no direction. You know, I just turned 30 uh, last week. So, uh, you know, my okay. mid, my mid-20s, I was very directionless but very interested in all this stuff. And the synchronicities through listening to podcasts eventually led to me working for uh, Sam Tripoli, whose podcast is, you know, top ranked and has been around for 10 or 12 years, which really, you know, skyrocketed this podcast and my, um, you know, attempt at podcasting. And the <laughs> synchronicity of that just like, you know, hurtled me into this whole world of people that I was familiar with through listening to all these podcasts. But now, you know, I go from being a fan of these people to being, you know, their peers, their, you know, their friends, their affiliates, you know. And for yeah. me, that was so inspiring and still is to this day that I've let that carry me through the podcast. And in many ways, the podcast is kind of guided by those synchronicities and, you know, who um, approaches me and us talking is a synchronistic sort of yeah. venture in a way because Michael Wan, who to me was very much like and still is like a mentor of this kind of thinking, uh, he recommended your work uh, a year or so ago and said, oh, you got to get this guy on your podcast. And um, and then obviously you're on the higher side chats and I know Greg pretty well. So he kind of was like, oh, yeah, Jake's easy to get in touch with. And then I found your Instagram, yeah. which was uh, Seal Lion for those who want to follow yeah. up. And we'll make sure that's linked in the description. But I do think there's yeah. a nature of this synchro mysticism that it happens to everybody on a daily basis, but it's really a matter of whether or not you're aware of it. So I guess my question to you is, when did you start becoming aware of these sinks in your own life or around your, your life? Um, so there was like a key moment that I kind of zeroed in on um, where it just really became apparent to me that this is a thing. I don't remember how old I was, but I was pretty young. Um, preteen kind of thing, or maybe just a teen, maybe I was 13, uh, but I forget exactly, but I was on vacation with my mom somewhere. And, uh, she was, we were at a store, like a secondhand bookstore. And she was like, pick, pick two national geographics. Cause I was into that. Um, and I was, went through these piles of them and I picked one and it was like, random just it, it interested me and then i picked another one for my sister i was like okay i'll get this one for me and this one for my sister and uh so i get in the car and we drive and then later on the, the day i pick them up and i flip through them and i'm like oh there's a picture of this national geographic in this national geographic and i was like oh that's kind of weird because the ones from the 70s and the ones kind of current and i'm like that's kind of neat to me but i didn't think much of it and it was a sort of specifically it was referring back to an article from the other national geographic about leonardo da vinci's horse he has this um lost sculpture that he started working on that was never completed Bit long story about napoleon troops invading and then melting it down for their cannons and whatever and in the more recent one of the national geographics it was referring back to that article and how da vinci's horse was never um completed and then saying that there's another guy who is completing da vinci's horse so he's found this the technical drawings and you know just sort of inspired by them made his own horse that's now in milan um of of, of da vinci's horse and then i was like hmm, that's just interesting information and then that same evening I watched the news and they just have like an interest piece at the end of the news. And it's the horse, Da Vinci's horse and the same story about the guy. And, you know, the other national geographic was like two or three years old. So the one was like from three years before and the one was from the seventies. And I'm like, on one day, I'm just like bombarded with Leonardo Da Vinci's horse. And it, for me, it seemed at that point, like there's just nothing that explains that nothing, my parents or, anything I've ever, you know, 
heard of explained that sort of seeming to me just it felt so significant even just the way it unfolded to me that it was very profound and it stuck with me i was like this is a thing and uh uh my interest in synchronicity and then later i would find out from other authors that this is a bit of a thing and that people are of this interest and it has a history and all that kind of stuff but but that happened to me before i'd even heard of the word and i was like this is significant absolutely so that, yeah no absolutely this seed was planted then and uh yeah of all of all symbols da vinci's horse you know one of the like yeah. greatest artists of our you know known recorded history and a horse which is such a like a charged yeah. symbol for human beings it's, it's very interesting the like uh stickiness of these ideas you know and how they can kind of pull you into these different directions and they almost pull these paths to one nexus point that you're viewing yeah 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 I, it's funny like i i feel like i haven't done much with that sync it's almost like all it did was like wake me up to synchronicity mm -hmm. i haven't like there's been some things like i know when i've watched hudson hawk you know they deal with da vinci in that movie and i feel like there's horses in that and uh you know so i thought of that as like a significant thing but generally speaking horses and da vinci don't feature that heavily in my sink hmm. uh but yet that you know i feel like maybe it will in the future some of these things are so epic to me it's like the arc of some of the synchronicities that i'm into can take many years like a decade even before it'll like loop back and i'll be like ah that's what that meant or that's why that was happening right. you know i've had like dreams or other things that was just really profound but i'm still waiting for well how does that slot in but every now and then a thing will and it'll just click and you'll be like ah there's yes. the big picture yes. so the da vinci horse thing i even went to milan once like uh and I forgot to look at the horse. I just didn't think about it. We were, I was like on a tour through Italy on a bus and it was like, things were happening. I wasn't really thinking about this deep history of my past situation. And then when I left Milan, I was like, wait a minute, why didn't I go see the horse? <laughs> like I was right there. So it's funny. It's like, it's super significant, but it also just sort of, it's somewhere in the background, you know, it's not like I, the most pivotal key moment that's like, I'm just fixated on, you know? Well, and that's the funny thing about synchromysticism in my short amount of time, you know, because when this podcast started, I quit my job as a delivery guy. And as a delivery guy, oh. I noticed a ton of synchronicity just in the randomness of my job. You know, there's a ton of numbers from the packages to the houses and so on and so forth. So there's yeah. just this sort of matrix of like information that I saw myself in. But when I quit that, I freed myself up. And I, yeah, I, I'm not suggesting to people, oh, hey, quit your job or whatever, you know, to, to, no, to, each, to each their own. This is where <laughs> my, my life was pulling me. And yeah. it almost like allowed the awareness of these synchronicities to be more stark and just more in my face, but also it, it made my life a little bit chaotic. And I'm wondering, like, with your experience with this, did you have you noticed over time like the sinks sort of reflect where you are as a person in your life your emotional state and so on yeah i mean i i definitely feel like the way you interpret them and uh that framework will be very much influenced by your belief system the things you've experienced in your life and then that can either be harmonious or not like I, i've i've definitely encountered a lot of people on this journey contacting me or other writers offers you know about synchronicity stuff uh video makers whatever um who have a different take and for them i feel like it's more like a it's almost a disturbance in their life or not a dis it's just something that's not necessarily bringing them closer to peace, which to me is sort of the point because it's, it ties into when I was saying, it's not really to me about the horse. Um, not, no sync is to me really in the end, there are some stories and narratives that I follow that I think are important and I learn more about life and its texture and whatever. But in the end, it's more about the fact that sync exists and the constant reminder that it exists 
and then what that says to me and means to me that I feel is the important part of sync. Yeah. It's sort of, there's like a Zen thing where it's like, not that which by, <laughs> not that, that which I know, that by which, where which I know, something like that. Just, it's more that it's the, it's the fact that it exists and what it says than the actual synchronicities that come up, which over time, especially after like, you know, almost 20 years of doing this, that I keep coming back to that where it's like, because I have sometimes gone on threads where I'm like, and it kind of drives you a little nuts. You're like following a sync and it just becomes more and more intense. And then you're like, this date, it's it's saying something about this date. And you get a little manic and you're like, it's so important. It's so important. And then you will build a narrative about that. This is going to be the the day where something really key happens, or maybe I'm seeing a sync like 9-11 come back up and it's like, these, this is part of that architecture that I'm seeing in the future, something happening, you know, all these weird narratives. And then sometimes those things will fizzle and I'll be like, well, am I crazy? <laughs> so I feel like over time I've learned to interpret it more as like just being aware of sync is really the message of sync yeah. and the fact that it exists to me is a very real thing. And is probably the most important thing about sync is just to incorporate it as like a real thing. And then what does that mean to you? Right. That's to me what syncs are constantly trying to do. You're, they're just trying to wake you up to the fact that they exist and that this has implications for what life is and what consciousness is. And that even the smallest thing, like there's a relationship between the external world and you, that is a very healing thing for a lot of people. Because I feel like as a spiritual person, it's easy to forget that a lot of people don't live in that world. They live like in a world where the external reality is matter and it's uh, hard and it's when you die, you die and all these kinds of things that I feel like the message of synchronicity is either ignored because it's, it's not real <laughs> or if it's taken in, it can get warped. But I feel like the basic issue of like a synchronicity being true and connecting you to the world because your experience is having some sort of interaction with the universe that's already profound enough, mm. but there's deeper layers to it for me, you know, that you can go into, but if really, if I can get people to like, see that I'm happy because that actually can positively change your life. Absolutely. Uh, With the, the, what's coming to mind is, and I'm a huge Bruce Lee fan. Uh, what's coming to mind is, is I think it's enter the dragon when he is teaching a student and he's pointing and he's like, Oh, not the finger. You know, 100%. yeah, and he looks at 100%. the moon. The right? finger pointing at the moon is like a very classic right. uh, way of maybe even better saying that. Uh, yeah, it's not the sink is not the finger. You know, well, the sink is maybe the finger, but it's not the moon. Right, <laughs> right, right. So like, and that's what it's you, just pointing. Yeah, and, that, and I think a lot of and I, I love the world that we're in with these podcasts. I think it's an ultimately positive thing. But there is a negative sort of juxtaposition with synchro synchronicities and the way people interpret them. Um, but it yeah. is it is this very personal, very spiritual thing that I think, you know, is part of why the title of this podcast is what it is. My family thinks I'm crazy because there's right. this clash between the way they see the world of material and the way I approach the world with this spiritual perspective. And, you know, I kind of right. came to that through martial arts and through, you know, some trauma and then maybe also some psychedelic yeah. experiences. But then For after sure. that, yeah. the synchro mysticism was kind of like, oh, wow, this was always here. You know, this was always here. I just didn't really necessarily yeah. call it that. And I, I you, you kind of reminded me of this feeling uh, with something you said previously. Um, and I wonder, what are your thoughts on like deja vu and these other sort of latent psychic? That are, they're very fairly common. I mean, deja vu is not something that only you know specialized people comment on. It's very common, yeah. right? But there are these sort of latent psychic abilities that we just kind of casually talk about without really leaning into. It feels like, at least in our Western society. And I wonder if synchro mysticism is almost like a a way of organizing those feelings into something a little bit easier to understand and communicate. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I definitely see synchromysticism and synchronicity as like related to all that stuff. Because I mean, often they'll interact, you know, it'll, something will feel familiar. It's like, that's a bit of a sync. Um, but I feel like all that class of ph phenomena is similar, um, that they're trying to remind you that there's something other than just you. Um, and I've, so I guess it functions to me like deja vu, um, those things all feel related to me. Um, now those are, are kind of mild, kind of positive, but then there's the, again, this negative side of it, which can, and I think you've probably experienced, uh, you know, people who are going through this sort of like active per paranoia, you know, to the point where this kind of information is, as you were saying before, maybe disturbing them rather than pushing them towards something that should be maybe a little bit more enlightening. Uh, Nirvana might yeah. be too strong, but it does feel like there's two sides of this sword and uh, synchromysticism can kind of get you in either way if you're not careful uh you don't take this seriously yeah um and i mean i feel like person personally i've been on the other side to a degree uh my journey to where i am included um also i think paranoia um ways of looking at the world that i find um not as good and not as clear as I feel like I view the world today. Um, but there were many times where interest in occult subjects or conspiracy subjects, I feel like interacting with the sync worldview um, were, and then depending on the offers and um, interests that I had at that time, were leading me into um, worldviews that seemed dark and um, um, just not as healthy as the one that I feel like I currently have. And then it was quite a journey, which, uh, you know, it, it, it makes me, when I see people who are still in those realities, I feel like I can somewhat understand what they're going through and why I don't see the world like that anymore. Um, but yeah, I've, I feel like personally, I had to kind of like work and grow and learn. And it, a lot of it was humility because a lot of the things that I feel like I was attached to had to kind of like go away. And a lot of the perception of who I was and what these things mean had to kind of like die in a way. And that required humility. Uh, I feel like was one of the biggest keys in my life was to realize that because I think a lot of it was like, well, I'm able to see these things, these conspiracies and these, the, and the people are ignorant. They're not seeing them. They're being manipulated. And all that, a lot of it's, I, after, over time, I realized a lot of it was ego. It was like, you know, I was very much into Crowley and, uh, you know, alchemy and that kind of stuff and magic. And I feel like at that point, there was a, a part of me that was very much, oh, I've done all this research and I've become aware of all these things and now I can see the world as it really is. And that's making me, I'm a smart person. I'm an intellectual person and I'm a brave person who can see the world in this, you know, way and the Illuminati and all these things. I understand that I've researched the symbols and I can see them and I, you know, people are being manipulated. And, but I've, over time, I realized a lot of it is my ego and my identity that's I find these things important because I want to be this person who can uh, see the world in this way. But it's not actually, over time, I realized the best way of looking at the world and the most humble way of looking at the world. And uh, it transformed and it changed. I, I would think part of it was for sure, like ceremony, like I started doing ayahuasca. And I feel like that really helped uh, open me up to seeing just how my own ego was also creating distortions of how I interpret synchronicity and uh, view the world. Yeah. There's a sort of archetype that I feel like you are 
describing, but you also, you've lived it, you've exemplified it, you've inspired other people to take on this archetype, but it's like a, it's a part of this human experience, this hero's journey that we go on to some extent to build up a villain and then become the hero that defeats it, where, you know, that might seem something like, you know, really profound to do. It sounds to me like you've realized that this was only on the stage of my own mind. This was purely a battle of the duality of my ego, not I wasn't actually fighting a real villain in the world. Is that kind of the sentiment? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it was realizing that a lot of the chains that you see in the world. Okay, so there's this nefarious conspiracy um, cause you, and you feel it, you see it, you feel it, you feel like there's something dumbing down the population. There's something, um, there's something going on. And I feel like a lot of the stuff is real and it manifests in the world as real, but what it comes down to in the end for me is fear and, um, attachment far more like, um, mystical, like not mystical, but I would say like spiritual fundamentals that then when the, those are incorporated, I feel like, especially in the Western mind, it's like when these things are not, when you don't have the, the right um, tools, you interpret a lot of the mysticism as like these negative things. So I feel like a lot of that melts and dissipates as you become like more, as you let go and as you become more humble. Um, so I do think a lot of the manifestations of the negative things you see in the world are actually you. Um, and it doesn't mean that I can't see outside me that there's a lot of harmful, negative actors and agents. <laughs> but I feel like I understand that as people who also have ego issues, identity issues, um, fear, anxiety issues, and that that's why the world manifests as, you know, there's corporate horrible things. There is real people conspiring to, you know, uh, be greedy and to hoard wealth and all this kind of stuff. You notice that as like neurotic, um, uh, manifestations of people who have not gone through this journey and have not let go and have not grown. And I mean, because the culture is sort of in from, from, from my perspective is kind of still young, it's, it's widespread. So the world actually looks kind of terrible, <laughs> um, but I don't, but you see it as a process and you feel, see it as like a, something that's still growing and healing and changing. Just like, I feel like the individual does the culture at large does, and it's still going through that process, just like I'm still going through processes, but like, I feel like at this point, I don't see that negative worldview. And I feel like the culture at large will still move towards that. I mean, we've done so much in the last de few decades where, you know, you just look at the world and it's like, you look at movies in the eighties and they're just so intensely like full of ignorance and sexism and, you know, just insane stuff that was like normal 30, 40 years ago, you know, is right. now like culturally frowned upon. And I think that's good growth. You know, that's really good growth, but that we can change so much, you know, um, is to me remarkable, but clearly we're still going through that process. And as an individual, you can do that work. And that is the collective as well, because you're part of the collective. So you're, you're doing your own healing that affects the collective and the collective is all doing their healing and that manifests as the world we live in. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like this acknowledgement of your fractal position, right? Like you exist simultaneously in a reality that you, in, in, a, in a way, are influencing. But sure. it works against you to where, you know, the same way your body is kind of programmed to start to, like, eat itself away if there's some kind of virus, you know, that's infecting the cells— if you get into a negative reality, it's almost like self-destructive. Like these negative realities can't exist in a trajectory that's healthy because it's just not wired that way. So you, you put yourself yeah. there and you, you, you know, you make the, you, you lie in the bed you made. Yeah. And I, I mean, and it's, it's really fascinating because the, 
the concreteness, the strength of a reality when it's like believes that what's true is that there are evil Illuminati forces or whatever you want to call it. If, if you want to believe there's some conspiratorial element or reptilians or something that are influencing this dimension from a higher space, those things will be presented to you. The evidence you need to believe that will manifest. And like even physically, like, and I've seen it, like I've experienced things where I'm like, here's the proof for these crazy realities that I'm believing in these extreme conspiracy um, things that are manifesting that really, really seem to prove it to me. But then as I, if I move into other realities, like that becomes concrete, you know, the, the, the ones of the higher vibe, it's almost like your, your brain is like a crystal matrix. You know, your consciousness is like some sort of, and the light going through it, like creates the world. And when I had like this negative configuration, it's like the triangle prism that was projecting my reality was like making it like concretely to my perception. There was no evidence that could sway me till that crystal healed and became like a more loving, humble, peaceful kind of loving thing. And then the world transforms. You still see the darkness, but even more quick, you understand it more clearly. It's all this process and it's healed, it's better. Um, but when it's like negative and dark, and we're drinking, and there's all these other things involved that I feel like were part of my journey, you know, it was like dark and it was very real. It was a very real thing. So I'm sympathetic as well. I'm not just saying, oh, people are stupid and they don't realize you should be enlightened and let go of those things. <laughs> it's very real for people stuck in that world, you know? Well, and I don't.